Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Equip You Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I have another Dave joining me, Dave Fiorazzo. Dave, welcome back to the show, brother. Hey, brother, good to see you, and Merry Christmas to you and your listeners and viewers. Yeah, it's good to have you back. Uh, we we really en- I enjoy talking with you, as always. Can you just uh, briefly catch us up on what's happening in your life, marriage, ministry, and what ministry projects you're working on? Wait, you didn't tell me this was a six-hour podcast. Oh okay, yeah, no, yeah, we're we're doing oh, the just yeah. thinking style today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me catch let me catch you up and condense everything. Well, um, I'm just thankful to have a, a new book out. It was a battle. Uh, it was supposed to be out a year ago, April 2022, but my life has changed in the last uh, couple of years, and uh, we'll get into a little bit of that later. Um, but I'm just glad to be able to be fighting through some of the battles we all have spiritual warfare if you're a Christian, and if you are a Christian that is unashamed of the gospel, as you and uh, myself, I try to be, you're going to be attacked. We are going to be attacked more. So we, we, as many of your viewers understand, we fight the good fight of faith, and our struggle is not against flesh and, uh, flesh and blood. So we we battle through these things. And I'm just thankful for another Christmas season. And uh, I kind of um, have a loathing for the word holidays. Because all you hear is holiday, uh, you know, so I purposely say Christmas as many times as possible. So Merry Christmas to you and your viewers. And, Merry uh, Dave, Christmas, I, everybody. Yeah, yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> I'm just thank, thankful to uh, be talking with you again. Yeah. And uh, yeah, God, to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Well, tell us about this book, Assault on the Image of God, Understanding and Responding to Attacks on the Bible, Human Life, and the Church. Uh, tell us a little bit about why you wrote it and how you sure. hope it'll be received. Well, sure. Um, first of all, the th- biggest thing to remember this, we are in a spiritual battle and we have to recognize that. I think a lot of people, it's, it, they, they try to turn the other way. They try to ignore evil in our world, in our country, in our culture, in our lives. And yet the devil is very real. You ignore evil to your own peril because then you don't understand how to respond to it. I think the subtitle, excuse me, of the book says it all. And that is understanding and responding, how to respond to these attacks. Attacks will come. They come in many different ways. And Satan uses human beings. He uses people to attack believers, to use, just just like we, this is a point I make, I think in the introduction in one of the chapters, the spiritual aspect of, we are called to make disciples, to preach the gospel, to make disciples. Satan also Part of his agenda is making disciples for godlessness, for wickedness. They're making disciples. And I'll tell you what, Dave, the way it's looked in the last 50 years in America and around the world, and even in the last 25 years, it would appear, at least on the surface, that Satan is making more disciples than the church of Jesus Christ in America. Because we have been a little apathetic, and I talk about the indifference, I attack I don't attack, but I confront the issue of apathy in the church quite a bit, <laughs> probably a <laughs> little bit in all, of, in all of my books. But yeah, and I'm not perfect. I, I try to be a voice. I try to stand up boldly, and, and I'm, I'll, I'll get the hits. You know, the attacks will come. But I try to encourage Christians, what are you here for? And that's maybe mm. a question. This Christmas season, mm. are you sharing the truth of Jesus Christ. There is a cost. You will be attacked. But what an honor, Dave. In this country, with the religious freedoms that we have, other co- that we are the anomaly. America is the anomaly around the world, man. Every other nation, there is, is the underground church. There are people that are being beheaded for their faith, for saying they're a Christian. Um, the, the underground church is, is persecuted. Um, I just talked to Todd Nettleton, Voice of the Martyrs, the other day. And um, what an update on true persecution. So Christians in America, we have become so stinking soft. We have become uh, really just a little fearful about even saying what we believe. And, and that's not God's will. That's not, I mean, look at, the, 
Read the New Testament. Look at the people that were vocal for the faith. They ended up to be martyrs, yes. And fortunately, we're not in that kind of country yet, uh, but it's going there. There's, and that, So I talk about the increased attacks on Christians, on the biblical worldview, and of course on our faith. But what, what is the bottom line? And that is Satan is attacking God. Yeah. God is, Jesus is being attacked, the name of Jesus, and we are just ambassadors and representatives. So as a result, we will also be attacked, right? So that's just that's just this this battle that we're in. We we are born again into this battle. Yes, we are new creations in Christ, if you yeah. believe, but we are also born into this massive war. And yeah. people like to uh, they don't like to acknowledge the warfare, but part of the book, a big part of the book, is reminding us: here's what's happening all around you, whether you would acknowledge it or not. This is going on. Now you have a choice and how to respond. And I try to encourage people to do what you can in your sphere of influence and then don't worry about it. Don't be overwhelmed, but surrender the results and everything else to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Such a good point. So many good points there about, you know, especially that Satan is making disciples. You know, R.C. Sproul, you know, yeah. when he was alive, he said that everybody is a theologian. The question is whether you're a good one or not. And we and we uh-huh. know that everything that everything that the Lord does, we see in the book of Revelation, you know, that the enemy wants to counteract, and he does. You know, he has the yeah. false trinity, you know. And we also fight against, as you were talking about, the world of flesh and the devil, as John talks about in first John. And so exactly. yeah, we, we have a real we have a real enemy and we have a real opponent, but he's still a vanquished foe. And so Amen. praise the Lord, you know, we have a resurrected king. So yeah, this is this is gonna be really good. So, uh, and guys, this book, Assault on the Image of God, uh, it is so good. It has uh, a lot of good stats, which I know you guys like stats because I talk about them. So, um, and then and then it's just full of good, a lot of good history and, of course, the Word of God and good theology. So, it's uh, really helpful. So, let's, let's dive in. Um, why should sure. uh, conservative Bible-believing Christians care about the assault on the image of God? Because the church has generally been asleep, and we've got a lot of ground to to retake, so to speak. We've got a lot of catching up to do, Dave. Um, and our pulpits in America, as you and I have talked about many times before, our pulpits have been silent on some of the most pressing, crucial, I will say controversial, but I will say moral issues that are sometimes uh, incorrectly called spiritual. Uh, political issues. Mm. Yes, maybe they are politicized. For example, abortion. I know that's a very divisive issue. What is it? What, well, what is a baby in, in the womb? Is it human? Yes. Is it growing? Yes. Is it, is it alive? Yes. Uh, so what are, what are they doing when they're eliminating a preborn human life? It's murder. So we've got to just call it like it is. We've been soft on this for years. And I, I'm fed up, as many of your viewers probably are, with the political ping pong in Washington, D.C. People get elected, they make promises, they go to Congress or the Senate, and they say, well, we're going to stand for life. We're going to pass legislation. Well, since 1973, that's gone on quite a long time. Fortunately, in my opinion, Roe v. Wade was overturned. But we have to recognize the war is still going on, and the left has been even more, more enthusiastic, more emboldened more passionate about killing babies, and I think more so than the right and Christians and independents and conservatives are willing to be passionate to protect and save lives. And that's sad. So they are always fighting, but that that war continues. That's just one example, just one example. So we have to recognize we're in a battle. We have not done well. Our leaders, our sergeants, our colonels, our pastors is what I'm saying. They're not CEOs. You've got to get that out of your head. We're not a business. We're, we're, we're in ministry. Our pastors generally have not been good leaders in on the cultural front. Maybe behind church doors, they might be doing fine. Some of the, your pastor's uh, friends, if you're watching right now, maybe they're doing, if you go to a church that preaches sound doctrine, the whole counsel of God, Genesis, Revelation, not shying away from the, the controversial issues, you are blessed, but you are in the minority of Americans, sadly as far as churchgoers. So 
we don't don't have leaders that have been able to lead us out on the battlefield and equip us. What's a role of one of the roles of the pastor, Dave? Equipping the saints for ministry, not equipping the sta- saints to stay home and to just be thankful we're saved and just looking forward to that day when we're going to heaven. As nice as that is, we've got a lot of work to do, but we haven't been led. No, that's that's really good. I mean, we even have the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, and we're not going to pick on Mike Johnson, but well, maybe for just a minute, you know, he had an opportunity to end abortion in in the state of Louisiana, and he opposed it. So, you know, we're we're we have to understand that it's not just enough to speak out about it. You know that that's why, you know, it's not enough. We have to be not only speaking out about it. And she she mentions how she's a biblical counselor, and she mentioned how we need to even do a better job. And this blew my mind. Uh, it might blow your mind too. We need to not only care about the mother and the baby in the womb, but we need to care about you know the grandparents and the family, and the we need to take a whole whole person approach. And I, I would say on these issues, I think. I mean, yes, you're right. Speaking out against it is absolutely an issue, but also seeing it as a whole person issue uh, and and matters of moral and ethical issues. We do a really, if we're going to be honest here about this, you know, since we're going there, uh, we do as a church. um, I've been a Christian since I was five, so I'm going to be 43 in February. Um, So, you know, add those up. It's like 35 years or whatever. Um, you know, we, I have seen, uh, a lot and we do a poor job. We either, we either go to almost towards the social gospel, which is no gospel at all, which, you know, that's the social justice aspect of things, or we, or we're just too soft. You know, it's like, you gotta get, guys, we have to get a spine. Paul tells us to speak the truth in love. And, and I'm not trying to be, I'm not, I'm not trying to pull any punches here, but I'm also not trying to be mean or rude, but we, we got to, if we're gonna, it's not even just about the vote. It's about the baby in the womb. It's, and it's about the whole family. And it's about the fact that God made the family and he, you know, he, he desires us to stand up for that. That's that, if we don't, if we're not willing to do that, um, we are going to – we're not going to lose our voice. I'm not saying that. But we do have to repent of, uh, like you're saying, of our apathy in this. And we ha- need to be prepared and ready to speak up. So Yes, and also, Dave, I want to encourage people, if you are not going to a church where you're getting a solid and sound doctrine and you are not being equipped and your pastor is not addressing the most important issues from – Israel to abortion to biblical sexuality to creation and all these other things, please respectfully and lovingly go to him. Don't just leave the church um, because a lot of people will just leave and and the pastors have no idea oftentimes why people leave. Well, we need to bring this to their attention, challenge them. A lot of them, it's a hard job. Being a pastor is a very hard job. I was for a while, and it is very difficult. Um, It's because you got to be called to be, but you also have to be willing to lead, and that's where we're really lacking. So go to them lovingly, encourage them, and just say, you know what? We need to know that the congregation needs to be led and equipped and know how to respond to all these things that are happening out there, and you're not even addressing it, whether it's a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or any other time of the week. You know, some pastors say, well, it's not appropriate for Sunday morning. I go, oh, okay. Well, when is it? You don't have a Wednesday night service. So so I just want to encourage you guys, go to your pastors. But I also will say, if they, I know a lot of people don't have a lot of churches that they can choose from in their area, but find a different church. If he says, eh, if he doesn't think it's important, because uh, some pastors are just sold on just the American Christianity uh, method, and that's we can get into that a- another time. But yeah. it's not always biblical. The programs and just the way the church is set up, and and uh, give me the book, chapter, and verse on how a church is to be run like a like a business rather than a ministry. We were talking a little bit about that before we got on the air. So, pastors, I, I love you, men of God. I, I pray that you are leading your congregations, and uh, th- we're here in a fight, in a battle for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he is returning, and uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and unfortunately, it, a big part of it is, a lot of it's because a lot of people are not or were not equipped, and now we have t- some re-education 
in a yeah. way, when it comes to uh, the truth and the biblical worldview, because that's on decline in America, we'll probably get to that as well. Yeah. And it's not only just the pastor, it's it's men in our in our homes. We we all need to be, you know, yes. personally putting our sin to death, not coddling it. Um, so men, you need to be leading your homes. You you want to pick on the 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 pastor, you want to point out his failures. How about looking at looking in the mirror and doing Hello. some self assessment? You know, uh, wives, uh, how are you doing at respecting your you know your your husband? I mean, it's it's not just picking on. We I don't want to I don't want any pastor to be like, well, you're picking on. We're picking on you. Well, how about right. you know men, men and women, and we need everybody on board here. We all need to be putting. We all have many ways in which we're all apathetic, if we're honest, myself included, Dave included, every single one of us. And so we all need to be addressing that in our lives. And so uh, let's Amen. let's go to this question. Why is a biblical worldview important for Christians? Oh, my goodness. Um, look at America, all right? And, and just think, I have a chapter called, What Would Our Great Grandparents Think? So what has happened in the last 50 to 75 years? The constant... Decline. Now it's a rapid decline of the biblical worldview, by the constant decline of biblical morality, of Christians being salt and light in the public square, understanding the Bible and how to approach it, and not not only that, but then how to apply it in our daily lives. That has gone down and down and down. So the importance of the biblical worldview, if we don't have the Bible as our foundation. I mean, you mentioned earlier, maybe it was in your prayer, that the inerrant word of God, it is, and that's another one of the attacks on inerrancy of Scripture. But if we don't have that biblical worldview as our foundation, the essentials of the faith, if we don't have that in the church, and we don't, our culture is going to be a mess. So now look out in the culture, look at how confused people are, especially young people today. Look at the delusion out there where Wow, it's a new revelation that men can have babies, men can be pregnant. No, but that's what a lot of people really think. So how did we get here? You remove God, you remove the Bible, the Word of God, or you remove the truth of creation, family, um, marriage, family, gender roles. Oh my goodness, Dave, it is a mess. And so now getting back to the biblical worldview, one of the big issues is, and Dave, I'm sorry, but I've got to come back to leadership. <laughs> yeah, Only 37 percent of pastors in America, church leaders, have a true biblical worldview. 37. Let's talk about youth pastors. That number is between 12 and 13 percent. If you're going to a church, friends, who's teaching your kids? Who's, who's your youth pastor? Who's leading your children on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night? Are they just playing games? Are they just there to occupy seats and entertain the kids? No. That's not the role at all. We are supposed to equip, disciple, build up, teach, and instruct them in the word of God. But we've gotten so far away from that. So that is the importance of the biblical worldview. Look at our culture. And should our, does the culture reflect the church? Or does the church reflect the culture? And sadly, short answer, the church kind of reflects the culture. I mean, we're entertainment driven. We are just not doing as good of a job as we could. So my encouragement, again, it seems like we're beating up uh, the church and the, the bride of Christ, man. Um, I, I don't want to be too critical because it is Jesus' church, not our church, not our pastor's church, um, not the, the church leaders, nor not a denomination or anything like, like, like that. It's the church of Jesus Christ. So we need to honor her as holy, but right now he's a mess. And so we got to start within instead of looking out. We can't expect non-Christians to act like Christians or have biblical morality or a biblical worldview. It comes right back to us in the church. That's the battle. That's who my book is for. The book is for believers to understand what's going on and, first of all, know the Word of God, and then how to respond to all these things that are happening with, and with truth and grace as our master our leader, our, our, our Jesus, our Savior, taught us because he was the perfect balance of grace and truth, as it says in, in uh, John chapter 1. Yeah, that's really good. That, that's why I think, you know, our pastors ought to go through some sort of formal process of ordination where they're tested, you know, any, anymore, where they, where they can know what 
they got to know what they they're the example they have to be paul says in first timothy 3 2 they the one thing they have to do is be able to teach well if you're going to be able to teach you have i'm not saying you have to go to seminary or bible college or anything but there's other ways and you have but you have to be tested you have to be tested to know if you know what you know know the word of god know good theology know what the church has taught and sadly, that's part of the problem it is it's not even just in the seminary. You know, we, we graduate uh, many times people that they don't even know even the basics. They've just kind of mm. skated through and they've but, – but even the proactive nature, I'll say it this way. And I say this as a seminary graduate. I have over 100 credits at the master's level. The problem is, is that we're not training young men and women for any kind of ministry and helping them to be discerning. We're feeding them all these programs and things, and those are good things. We have to – programs can serve people and help them to get plugged in. But if you place that focus on programs above doctrine, yes. that's the problem yes. that we're having, and that's the problem well, of pragmatism. Well, Dave, I talk a little bit about that in one of the chapters that we don't get into the seminaries a lot, but that's part of the problem. A lot of them have been compromised. What do I mean by that? A lot of them have dropped the inerrancy, belief in the inerrancy of scriptures. Many seminaries teach how to grow a a big church. So so wait a minute, Christianity about the numbers? Uh, give me give me book, chapter, and verse on that, because the only time they really care about the numbers is when they mentioned how many people were fed by Jesus, um, but they didn't, and then how many followers came to the Lord, like 3,000 in one day after Peter preached or whatever. But so, but there, the focus has not been on numbers, but today, because of the Americanized influence on the church and the business model, now you're supposed to just try to attract a crowd. Anybody can attract a crowd. But what do you do when you get non-believers, people that are not Christian or people that are just seeking, you get them into your church? Okay, so you use entertaining methods to attract them. What are you going to do to keep them? Are you going to be able to feed them? Are you going to be able to give them the whole counsel of God? Are you going to be able to preach on Revelation and the Old Testament creation? Uh, Whatever. So, yeah, we have a lot of problems, and and I don't want to focus on the seminaries too much, but this is such a wide um, um, array of, of issues that we have to deal with, but it's just understanding them, not to be overwhelming, friends, but understanding this is the state of Christianity in America. I know we have some viewers probably from other countries. Maybe you can relate to some of this as well, but this is the state of Christianity in America, and we've got to do our best to say, all right, that's done. That's the past right now. Help me to do what I am called to do in my personal life before God. What are your gifts? What what are you called to do? Be obedient to the Lord. Don't focus. Don't let other things sidetrack you. But just you know, use your gifts and talents for the kingdom. And every one of you, every one of us, has a sphere of influence. Some larger, some smaller. That's irrelevant. It's being called by God, being an ambassador, and representing our King Jesus Christ. Well, in this day and age, right? And surrendering the rest of the Lord. Yeah, we do. We do have a lot of people that watch the show and listen to it from uh, Europe and and Asia as well. And and we know that America. You know that America is the exporter of of all things. And so, for for good or bad, you know. Um, but you know, so so even you could be encouraged that two Americans are sitting here having this conversation, and and uh, everybody knows that I'm not afraid to. You know, by God's grace, um, it's not about me, but I'm not afraid to talk about the the, the hard and the difficult things. And um, so, uh, be be encouraged that two Americans are sitting here having this conversation. We both are convinced of the the truthfulness of the Bible, and we both uh, love the church. We we've given our lives to serve the church, and so when we yeah. are saying what we are, it, it has nothing to do with being personal or attacking the church or anything. It's just saying, hey, let's hold up the mirror and 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 have that conversation, you know, with the Word of God. So yeah, so uh, Dave, I think it it, uh, it needs to be said. There are a lot of wonderful, God fearing men and women uh, in ministry today across the country and around the world. But let's just talk about America. So there there is a remnant of sound, solid Bible believing, truth proclaiming churches and and congregations. So I don't want to minimize the fact that. God can do a lot 
with a minority. <laughs> just read the Old Testament, right? Even the New Testament. Um, he can do a lot with, with just a small number of people. Look at Jesus and 11, you know, 11 disciples. But we can do what God calls us to do. And don't be too discouraged on what we're talking about. We're just being realistic. We're acknowledging the problems, not focusing on the problem, not at all being overwhelmed by the problems because God is big. God is huge. If God before us, who can be against us? We can do all things through Christ and no weapon formed against us will prevail. And he can do anything that he wants. Let's not get in the way. So let's just be open to what he wants to do in our lives. That's my encouragement to you. So yeah, acknowledge the problems, but let's not stay there and be batting, you know, you know, beating that over the, you know, the head. Let's just, just focus on what we can do. Dave, really quick. Can I just mention the cover real quick? For people that see this book online, um, I have a section called About the Cover because it looks like, wow, is that a study on Revelation? <laughs> no, it's not. It's a very uh it's a it's to the lay person, to the average basic Christian that just wants to understand how we got here in America and what's happening with all the evil around us that's on steroids today, and how we need to be better at responding to it. So I mention that because you've got the dragon on the cover. And you've got the the woman, the pregnant woman, and that might re- remind you of Revelation chapter twelve. And that's part of the idea. I, I wanted the cover to be provocative to make people look at it and go, "Wow, what's that book about?" So in Revelation twelve, as you know, the dragon represents Satan, the woman represents Israel, and he's pregnant. And of course, Jesus would be born. She will give birth to a male child. So I just, I talked a little bit about that in the two or three pages right before the introduction to the book called About the Cover, just because I wanted to talk a little bit about Bible prophecy and a little bit about revelation, a little bit about symbolism and what things represent in scripture. But the whole understanding is Satan is attacking Jesus, believers, and the church. And how he is doing that, I really make that very clear and all the different institutions in America, all the different ways he was attacking. So I just wanted to share that about the cover because people look at it and go, it, it almost looks like it could be a fictional book. Remember um, Frank Peretti? Remember This Present yeah. Darkness? Yeah, yeah. Piercing the Darkness? It almost looks like, wow, is that one of those books? No, I talk about what's going on in uh, the education system, in the media, in our own government, in nonprofits, in the church. And I talk about culture a lot with the... Uh, the onslaught of the LGBTQ agenda and the now the confusion over gender. And so I, I talk a lot about cultural issues. And um, so I just wanted to share that. So there's a lot going on. And on the cover, there's the picture of the church on one side over there because the church is being attacked. And there's, you know, there's the American flag there. I put that in there. It's kind of like subtly to make, okay, this is an American town, right? So the attacks come. And how do we respond? That's the bottom line. That's the question that I try to answer throughout the book in all these different areas. Yeah. I think one of the biggest areas that we should probably talk about is how should Christians respond to attacks on the inerrancy of Scripture? It's a topic that we often come back to on on this particular show. But what are your thoughts about that, brother? Well, like I mentioned earlier, um, seminaries, we're we're in a world of hurt when church leaders are not being adequately equipped in that foundational belief. There's something called, uh, you might have seen this meme, Dave. Um, um, what was it called? The, the steps to postmodernism. There's this descending staircase, and it looks like it's going down into a dark, you know, whatever, lower level basement dungeon or whatever. But there's men and suits and briefcases going down this staircase, and it's the steps to postmodernism. It starts with Christianity at the top, the Christian faith. Then one step down is surrendering the belief in the inerrancy of Scripture. Once you do that, you take the next step, and then it might be that might be um, the biblical worldview. Then that then the next step might be okay. I don't believe in the virgin birth. The next step, I don't believe in the deity of Jesus. And every step is descending to postmodernism and this post-truth culture and world that we're living in now. So the inerrancy, once you surrender that, I think, I don't remember if I have a quote in the book from Francis Schaeffer. Um, let me just double check real quick. Um, it, would, it would be toward the front if, if it was. I remember talking about that in an interview. Here we go. I do have a quote from Schaeffer on page 40. 
He says this, um, here is the great evangelical disaster, the failure of the evangelical world to stand for truth. There is only one word for this, namely accommodation. The evangelical church has accommodated the spirit of this age. First, there has been accommodation of scripture so that many who call themselves evangelicals hold a weakened view of the Bible and no longer affirm the truth of all that it teaches. Truth not only in religious matters, but in matters of science, history, and morality. And of course, I talk a lot about in that chapter about once you take that step, and it can be a very subtle step, because you have to believe the Bible is God's perfect, flawless, inerrant, righteous word of truth. And it is. But once you surrender or or give in to any compromise there in that foundational step, you have nowhere to go but down. And so um, so you can find that meme, guys, viewers, if you're watching, listening to this, look for that. Um, I I forget what it's titled, but it has something to do with the steps to uh, postmodernism, I believe. But it's phenomenal. It's a great picture of the every step down is compromise. So even creation would be in that, the biblical creation. And, and what, what do you get when you surrender that step, for example? Once you surrender the inerrancy of Scripture, creation, particularly Genesis 1 through 11, then you get, well, maybe maybe men can have babies. Maybe a man can get pregnant. Maybe a boy was supposed to be a girl. Oh, that means God made mistakes, right? So if I can, if I was born in the wrong body, that much, that's not my fault. That's God's fault. So every step down is compromise, and it leads to different cults and doctrines and other things that are dangerous and, and really are in conflict with the truth. Oh, uh, no, that's that's really, really good. You know, we live in this. I think we've talked about this before, you know, when you're standing up for the truth and those kind of things. You know, we live in this culture of, you know, we, we call it a uh, – there's actually like a long history to this, but it's a cult culture of skepticism and doubt. You know, oh. we, we see this with, you know, in your progressive, you know, Christian churches. Um, and, and even over 100 years ago, we had J. Gresham Machen. He left Princeton University, uh, started Westminster Theological Seminary, which we've yeah. been blessed to have many of the professors on this show. And, I mentioned uh, him in the chapter, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and quote he, him twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, another religion, a different – it's a different religion. Why, though? Because they believe a different – they they don't believe the biblical worldview. They don't believe that the Bible yeah. is without error or without the possibility of error, which is, yeah. you know, infallibility. And so, you know, that's that's why it matters. How can we have truth? How can we have law? Even Harold Bergman, who was a professor of law at Harvard University, understood that without religion, you can't have law. Why? Because – you know, we have to have absolute truth. We have yeah, to. Where have, are you going to get your morality from? Yeah, right? where, yeah. Where yeah. where are you going to? How are you going to deal with the things that that really matter? And and mm-hmm. don't we see that today? Um, just to bring this out, we we've seen this in the last couple of years, haven't we? Everybody with you know the attack on police and and in our government Lawless- and so on and so oh. forth. So yeah, lawlessness, and that's that's in that Second Timothy three, I believe. Um, or in a couple different places talks about lovers of self, uh, yeah, lawlessness, yeah. yeah. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing the fruit of that in our culture. Oh, that's you know what? That's that's going to lead me to another chapter that I think you you also wanted to talk about, and that's the attacks on Christians, churches, and free speech. Yeah, go so for I'm it. Kinda, I'm kind of combining two chapters here, but there's a perfect example um, of lawlessness. Um, I quote: Is it Pastor Matt Truella? Missionaries of the Freeborn. I quote him on page 59 and 60 in the book. This is a perfect example of how not only pastors, but men and women of God can respond to what's going on in public. Here's let me set the scene for you. Uh, Watertown, Wisconsin. There was a Pride in the Park event this past June. Public park in Wisconsin. Up on the stage, there were there was a drag show with the Pumping music, boom, boom, boom. They were gyrating, right, and dancing provocatively, and they were scantily clad. A lot of the homosexual men dressed as raunchy women. You know the drag shows, right? So 
Uh, I'm not saying they're all homosexual, but come on. So anyway, they're, so they're dancing up there. We got families in, in the park waving the rainbow flags. And the, the men, just as women, are dancing and they're really sexual. What they're doing is sexualizing young children. They are trying to recruit. Some call it grooming. They're, and I, I love a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Steve Smotherman, says, the left, the LGBTQ left, they cannot reproduce, so they have to recruit. And they're doing a good job using the public education system, using social media, using Hollywood. They're recruiting children. And Christian children are in that too sometimes. But let's go back to the park. So that's going on. At the same time, there are five Christians in their 20s, roughly. They're, they're out there sharing the gospel, handing gospel tracts, having conversations with kids. I'm sum- summarizing these two chapters here, Dave. Four of those Christians were arrested A public park paid for by our tax dollars. Happened to be in Wisconsin. This is not an isolated case. Different places in the country, it's happened. Christians sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible. I wasn't even sharing anything controversial. This one of them, they were handing out tracts, but one of them was standing on a sidewalk reading the book of Galatians. Not even controversial, not even Genesis, creation, not even talking about homosexuality. He was talking about God's love. And he was reading the book of Galatians. The police officer, I saw the video. The police officer goes up. He said, he says, sorry, you can't do that here. And then his friend that's videotaping the whole thing saying, what, what did he violate? What did he do wrong? They made him turn around. They handcuffed him. His name is Marcus Schrader. He walked away on the back of his shirt. It said, I will stand for truth even if I stand alone. So four Christians arrested. They were sexualizing children up on that stage in the public park with the drag show. For, with the pride event, right? In Wisconsin, there is a, a statute that it is a felony to sexualize young children. And it goes into some of the detail, but the people up on the stage could have been arrested. The ones putting on the drag show and dancing and going out in front of the families and doing this, they're sexualizing children. So enter Pastor Matt Well, after all this is done, after this all happened, he saw what happened. And he's speaking. This is an amazing teachable moment. That's why I quote his entire, it was about two minutes, two two minutes and 15. I have his transcript. He's speaking to six or seven police officers. He's saying, you don't understand the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. You may have been giving your marching orders by your mayor, by your governor to stand down when it comes to the, the pride event, but you may have given orders to arrest the Christians. That's wrong. Right? Remember, you brought this up, Dave, by talking about lawlessness and police standing down and just ha- having, remember what happened in 2020 in streets on inner cities all across America, billions of dollars in damage. But anyway, so he's rebuking them lovingly. It was a very well informed and respectful um, presentation with, in, with the captive audience. The police are just standing there. And he got through the whole thing. And it is brilliant. I encourage people to look at the video. Um, but it's in my book. I quoted the context. And he said, here it is. You have the guns. You are in the authority. And Romans 13 says, you are to your job as servants of the public, as ministers of God, is to punish evil and reward good. Reward people that do good, punish the evildoers. And he said, what you've done today, it's it's that justice has been flipped on its head. You arrested the good guys. You arrested Christians for sharing the gospel. And you let the other ones, and at that moment, he was saying that, Dave, he pointed up on the stage, because at that time, there was something really sexual going on with one of the drag queens. And he says, look up on that stage right now. Are you kidding me? He said, this is what you're allowed to take place with young children present. And then he reminded the police officers, respectfully, of the statute. The fe- it is a felony in Wisconsin to sexualize young children. So all that to say, we have opportunities if we are to use them well. And I can't guarantee, he could have been arrested, but he wasn't. He was do- doing it in a very respectful way. But yet, there were young men, and I think a, a young woman that were arrested for just going in the park, giving out gospel tracts, and having conversations with the LGBTQ community. If we love People, we will tell them the truth and warn of coming judgment. But you can do it in a way that you're not beating them over the head with the truth. You are lovingly warning them because you want them to be saved. So I share that because that kind of encapsulates these chapters on 
attacks on Christians, on the church, and on free speech. That's just one example, but I shared a perfect, perfect illustration of how a pastor, any man of God, can respond to this. And it was just really, uh, I really encourage people to just look at the book just for that chapter. That's that's really, really powerful. And you actually bring up uh, such a good point because we we do talk about, you know, these matters on the show, especially, you know, challenges as we're facing on biblical sexuality as well. So how should Christians respond to the growing challenge of transgenderism? Mm. Well, again, it goes back to creation, the truth of creation. We've got to go back and make sure our families are grounded in the truth. I think one of Colossians, one of the prayers in Colossians is that they would be rooted and grounded in the truth of Christ, in the in the love and the truth of Christ. And so we've got to make sure since the government is not going to educate your kids in the Bible, public school system who is antichrist, they are not going to educate your kids in the Bible. You can't even say Merry Christmas in some public schools. So they have removed God and Jesus the creator and anything to do with biblical creation. And they have been teaching, not as theory, but as fact, the theory of evolution. Go figure. So it's no wonder kids are confused. And so transgenderism is off the charts today. I think I read something just this week. I'm trying to remember the number. There's been something like a 3,000% increase in America in this younger generation identifying as either transgender or part of the LGBTQ. Dave, that's good programming. And it is what, that's exactly what it is. It is programming. So how can we respond to transgenderism? Again, with the truth. You said it earlier on, with speaking the truth in love. They are not going to get it by Christians being silent. Where are they, where, where in our country if you don't go to a Bible-believing church, or let's just say non-Christians, where are they going to hear the gospel? Where are they going to hear the truth about how they were created? In the image of God, Imago Dei, the attacks, um, the assaults on the image of God, because Satan hates Imago Dei. He hates the image of God and the truth that every human being is created in God's image. So Satan hates that right away. So the way kids are so confused today is because we've done such a poor job of resisting this demonic assault through the decades now. It didn't start with Bruce Caitlin Jenner. I can call him Caitlin because he legally changed his name to Caitlin. So I can call him Bruce Caitlin now. But it didn't start with Caitlin Jenner, didn't start with some of the modern, you know, transgenders that are now playing males playing in women's sports. I have a transgender timeline in my book that goes back to the late 1940s. Hello. A lot of people in your audience are now going, no way. Pick it up. I document from the 1940s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the transgender timeline events that took place in our culture, in our country. One example real quick. I think it was 1953. There was a movie that Hollywood put out. I believe it was called Eric or Erica. Wow, that's in the book. Let me. I'm, I'm just going to look at that real quick because I don't want to misquote. Say I didn't. Um, I wasn't planning on mentioning that. But so there's the there's the transgender timeline, and it goes back to the 1940s. And I just gave you one example. Here it is. Um, 1953. I'm sorry, it wasn't Eric or Erica. It was Glenn or Glenda. It was a 1953 movie by Ed Wood. It was a film that dealt with transsexuality. And transvestism. And again, it was called Glenn or Glenda. And it had the male, the female, the half, like, like you can be either one. So this confusion and the delusion started decades and decades and decades ago. I mean, the first uh, transgender surgery, I think, was, um, was in the 1950s. Anyway, so oh, yeah, 1952. 1952, the first, quote, sex change. Um, Christine Jorgensen, if I remember right. So Dave, this is just an eye-opener to a lot of people that are watching and listening right now because they're thinking this is much more of a modern phenomena. Did you know that uh, Hellenistic uh, philosopher uh, Philo, at the time of Christ, he wrote about men impersonating women. Wow. 
Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun, is there, Dave? No, there's not. And, you know, Tucker Carlson, what was that, a few years ago, he said that this this ideology, and he even was, I was so amazed. Here's a, on na- national TV, Fox News, he's he's saying, encouraging Christians to, to speak up. Yep. I mean, my goodness, that that was I, like, blo- that blew my mind. I'm sitting here like, what am I, what am I listening to here? Like, I don't even I'm know, very, but, you know, uh, but. Yeah, but I'm we, very thankful for him. Tucker Carlson, uh, he was a truth proclaimer. Um, he's not perfect. But he did so much to try to get to try to confront evil and to try to just talk about common sense and biblical morality and saying, what's how, how come you're not standing up to this evil in our culture and our government? And, you know, so I, I really respected the work that he is continues to do different platforms. Yeah. How should Christians respond to attacks on children, family, marriage and life? Well, we, we kind of touched on each one of those um we didn't touch on well, children. First of all, are, are you are you willing to protect the most vulnerable? Um, this goes down to the preborn, but let's just talk about children that are already born. There, there is a movement and agenda, demonic minions, and we talked about forces of darkness that are using and manipulating human beings. I mean, there's people on the left. There's people that are doing evil. Some, from a biblical perspective, now some are deceived. Others are deceivers on purpose, agenda-driven, God-hating, rebellious deceivers. But some are truly deceived by them, but they are still being used by the enemy. So if you can come after children, I mean, this this is age-old you know, wisdom from the most brutal world dictators to you know people that just want to control society. You go after the young generation, you go after the children. So we've got to be willing to say, we will fight for our children. And Dave, one thing I want to say, I've been encouraged in the last maybe five, six years by moms and dads going to public school board meetings and standing up and saying, not my kids, you're not going to. And, and that's why the homeschooling movement is booming right now. It is growing. It is in private schools, homeschooling. Christian schools, praise God for that. It wasn't just COVID. I mean, they use that as an excuse. Yeah, they're doing, they're homeschooling because, you know, the uh, online, you know, education during COVID. No, that's not it. Because insanity has got into the public school system. It's not insanity. It's a demonic agenda. But what they're pushing is let's reach the children and let's indoctrinate them. So what you're happening, and, and I come from a family of teachers. So I'm, for those of you that are teachers in the audience, my dad, my mom, my sisters, my uncle, you know, that were in the public school education system. It is not the same as it was in the 50s or the 60s or even 70s and beyond. So what they're doing is they're going after children at younger and younger ages. And Dave, the Christian community and the church has not been resisting this. So now we see the fruit, don't we? We see the rotten fruit of children K through 12 after they graduate from high school. They're already, if they were, if they're from Christian family, they're already gone. It's not, they start, um, surveys now prove kids start doubting their faith in middle school. So if they start doubting the biblical worldview of the Christian faith, there are reasons for that. One of them is the teaching of evolution, and they don't talk about Christ or the Bible in the government schools. So if they start doubting in middle school, by junior high or high school, they're gone. They're already gone. In the 1980s, I believe, or the early 90s, the the research was after one year of college at a public university, they children would leave their faith if they grew up in a, quote, Christian home. And you can define what a Christian home is. But for general understanding, if you grew up believing in God and the Bible, maybe going to church on Sunday, after one year of college, and you understand that now the universities are are really indoctrination centers for the left. So that was in the 80s. We have to recognize times have changed. They've made a lot of progress and the left has gained ground. So now kids are doubting their Christian faith or else what their parents told them or taught them by the time they're in middle school. So we've got to recognize, protect the children. That's how we can resist this. We've got to go after our children first. Protect your children. And then here's where the responsibility comes in for the rest of us. If we love our neighbor, oh, oh now I've got a responsibility. Uh-oh. If I love my neighbor's children, I will want to protect them. 
I will want to make sure they are going to somehow hear the truth and not be lied to. I, I want well, I will want to make make made sure that the lies will be exposed and the darkness will be exposed. If we love our neighbor, I know that's a lot. It seems like a heavy load because of where we're at today. But that's what it comes down to. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. What does the Bible say? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we can't do it all. Again, your fear of influence. My, I can't reach everybody. Dave, you're reaching people that I couldn't reach. Uh, maybe you're someone that's watching right now. You will be able to reach people in your family or or neighborhood or community that Dave or I could never reach because they're not going to look up one of our shows if they're not believers, especially. They're not going to find Worldview Matters, or they're not going to find Servants of Grace or look up Dave's ministries. So you can love your neighbor by caring about them enough to speak the truth, to tell them tell them what's going on, to care about their children. No, that's that's really good, and I and I know in in our audience we have we have teachers who are working in the public schools, and I hear I hear yeah. them all the time, you know, from them, you know, whenever, especially whenever we talk about these things, and and it's tragic, it's sad, it's really heartbreaking, uh, but keep keep being there because we we need we need people not to leave that place we need christians in that place because if if we abandon uh the doctrine of vocation where god sends us out from the local church to wherever he would place us uh where our society is going to get infinitely worse and that's especially true in in the in the our schools we need christian teachers in our school and not just teachers we need assistants we need people in the special ed that can show the love of christ and share the love of christ with these people even yes we have to use words okay but sometimes showing the love of christ and leads to those opportunities where we can you know have those kind of conversations and um or it leads to a parent what, what's so different about this 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 uh, uh special ed teacher Teacher over and against, you know, this uh, special ed teacher or teacher or or whatever. What what's so different about their attitude and their disposition? Um, mm. So it might even it might even get a parent to think about. So then that might lead to an opportunity and a conversation where you know you can you know share about uh, the hope that you have. And and by the way, that's the, that's just First Peter three fifteen. You know, right? Uh, give an answer for the reason for the hope well, that you have. So. Yes, Dave, but you have to recognize uh, generally if you're working for the government, your hands are tied. If they're willing to be fired or disciplined or suspended for sharing the gospel, you know, God bless you. Um, but you can be a light, meaning you can be there as a presence to see what's going on and try to protect young kids from these ideologies, from this from radical sexual education, from the uh, the the infestation of Pride Month, which is basically we're all year. It's not just a month, right? Let's just be honest. Watch the TV commercials. Look at what's happening in the schools with the rainbow posters and flags. It's not just in the month of June. They're not even in school in June. Uh, so we have to recognize Christian teachers. Yes, you, you need to be there and God bless you and strengthen you for the task because you must, and a lot of them must deal with discouragement because they can't really speak up and share much about the biblical worldview, but you can teach true history you can be kind of like be a watchman there and kind of like be a spy. <laughs> but I'll just I'll just be honest because I know friends uh, that have had to leave uh, public education because they couldn't be silent anymore. And so it, it is a very difficult position. Um, so I, I, just, I just ask our people to pray for wisdom for those who are in public education who are Christians. And it's a very, very small minority. But pray for you. Pray for them who are trying to make a difference in that institution. And I, and I would just say to, to teachers that listen and, and watch and those who are in the school, at, at, and if you're a Christian, at some point, you're going to have to count the cost. You know, and, and unfortunately, in the time in which we're all living, there's going to be a cost that's going to be attached, whatever that cost is. But that cost, it, what, what's more important? You know, to count the cost and to follow Jesus, as Jesus himself says in Luke 9, 23 through 27, or to follow the world. The cost is always, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, it's costly. It's costly yeah. grace. There's not cheap grace. There's costly grace. You know, Jesus didn't come, he said in Matthew's gospel, to bring peace. He came to bring a sword. He came to pit family against 
family. That doesn't mean that, you know, literally family members, sometimes family members are going to be, be against us because of our stand for the truth. Because, and that's where we have to count the cost. But the cost is always going to cost something. It's always going to cost something. But, but it costs Jesus even infinitely more. What, the only reason that we can put our sin to death and have a cost is because of him, right? And so, you know, if, if that means that you feel that you can't speak up, that's the time when you probably should be speaking up. You know, um, and and this is, by the way, a matter of wisdom, like you're touching on Proverbs 11 in the abundance of many counselors, there's wisdom. So I'm not saying I'm not urging you to just go and speak up whenever I'm saying we want to say this, that there is a place to go to your pastor. There's a place in Titus 2, it says, you know, if you're a woman, go to an older woman and get some wisdom, get some counsel, get some wisdom from your pastor, uh, or if you're a man in teaching, get a wisdom from an older man, um, and and get that help that you need to know when, you're, when you should speak up and how you should speak up, because both are, both matter, both matter, the timing and the how, like you were talking about earlier, right. and, and the Bible has so much to say about that. That's, that's why we need wisdom, brother. I mean, when we are outside, you know, of our homes and our churches, um, how do we represent? There, and that's the importance of the Holy Spirit being willing to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying I, I've got a lot of growth needed in this area where I need to be a little more sensitive to the Holy Spirit's voice. When, well, maybe when I'm at the grocery store or the gas station, when I'm so distracted with my own stuff and in a hurry. I need to slow down sometimes so that we all need to be, I think, a little better at that. Yeah, we all can. I remember one of my one of my pastors in Idaho. I never saw him get upset or anything, but he would say, Dave, I, I still have a lot of room to grow in gentleness. And and in these and that's if that's true for him, he'd been a Christian for, you know, many, many years, 40, 50 years in ministry for 40 plus years. Um, that's true for all of us. I mean, I, I get convicted just thinking about it. So, yeah. you know, it gets a little warm in here. But the, the thing is, is we all have room to grow. And, and like you're saying, and we all need wisdom. That's why we need mm-hmm. Christ and we need one another in our local church. And so, mm-hmm. um, well, brother, where, tell us about this new show, Worldview Matters, and where can oh, people find you on great. social media? Yeah, thanks for asking. It's worldviewmatters.tv, worldviewmatters.tv. Uh, it's put on by Freedom Project. It was an opportunity that came my way um, well, really shortly after um, I resigned from a, a previous a position and uh, unexpectedly, but it, it, this is what happened. And then they came to me and said, have you ever thought about doing another podcast? And I, I really hadn't, but this is a video show, video format, 30 minutes, and it's available on uh, freedomproject.com. On uh, They've got a Rumble channel. They are on... Uh, is it YouTube, YouTube and Spotify, Apple podcasts, and, you know, wherever you can hear audio, you can go look that up there and video at worldviewmatters.tv or freedomproject.com. So it's, it's, it's just started in late September, mid September, roughly. So, um, and you're going to be on in January next month. Yeah, I'm excited. And guys, we they've uh, Dave already has had uh, Holly Pivot, who we've had on, and Doreen Virtue. The Doreen Virtue yeah. episode was really good, by the way. Um, Thank you. Praise I, yeah, God. It was, it was it was really good. So, just as we land the plane on on this conversation, brother, uh, there, you know, there's a lot that we could really dive into, and we've really yeah. only scratched the surface on all these. If you can believe that, guys, we really have. Um, you would be here much longer if we had if we were going in depth. But uh, can you give us just a few takeaways as we end the conversation today? Sure. Um, first of all, you can get the book on Amazon and um, Olive Tree Views, Jan Markell's ministry. They're offering at the lowest price you can get anywhere. So I just want to give them a plug. But olivetreeviews.org in their store, you can get assault on the image of God. But foundational point, we're in a spiritual battle. We can't deny it. Um, we can we can try to ignore it, but that is not responsible as men and women of God, as ambassadors for Christ. So the spiritual battle is happening, whether we we like it or not. We are in a war. Satan hates us, and he hates our Savior Jesus Christ. That's our Lord. That's our Master. That's our you know troop leader, our sergeant, and uh, we take marching orders from God, His Word, the Word of God. And so 
the bottom line is we have to understand where the attacks are coming from, what the enemy is using, who the enemy is using, how these attacks in different areas of life are happening, what they look like. And there's some demonic agendas out there. We have to be honest. And then rather than, I like the verse Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So rather than be overwhelmed and go, all oh, this is our, our, you know, look at how dark it is. It takes a little bit of light, one person at a time, a little bit of light, the light of Christ. So we have to respond in wisdom, but in truth, grace, and with the love of Christ. And we can do that, friends. It's not impossible. Yes, it is hard. I think Dave and I clearly pointed out it. there is a cost. But look at the rewards of honoring our king and doing the work that he's called us to do with the, the, the gifts and talents that each one of us has. On the other side, and this life is but a vapor, right? And on the other side, in eternity, man, we're going to be so thankful that we worked a little bit harder and did not deny that there was a battle going on and that we recognize we're on a battleship, not a cruise ship. Sorry, that's not biblical Christianity. So to recognize that, to respond, so that kind of sums up what I'm trying to communicate through all of the chapters I write in the book. And then I also, Dave, real quick, I share this story in the last chapter on encouragement and keeping the faith through trials. I share about my wife and I and our personal um, journey in the last couple of years since uh, you know COVID. Um, she took one of the vaccines, and since then she has had uh, a cognitive neurological disorder. And so she's had severe problems with just short-term memory and basic application of things. She can't drive anymore and just a lot of different things that changed our lives. But I'm continuing in the ministry. I'm continuing to do what God's called me to do, taking care of my wife, helping her. We're still seeking treatments and hopefully a referral to Mayo Clinic. But um, all that to say, there are trials and um, God is sovereign over all of them including all of the attacks, including all of the things we see happening in America, toward Israel, around the world, the globalist push, the demonic agendas, God is on the throne. He is sovereign. So we can take heart in knowing that Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So friends, keep on believing, keep the faith, and keep fighting the good fight. Amen, brother. Amen. Well, guys, we've been talking with my friend David today from Worldview Matters about his book, Assault on the Image of God, Understanding and Responding to Attacks on the Bible, Human Life, and the Church. I want to encourage you to go ahead and pick it up um, where David mentioned. Uh, it's also available on Amazon. And uh, Dave, thank you so much, brother, for joining us on the show today. Oh, always a blessing, brother. Always. Thank you so much. You have a Merry Christmas. And everybody that's watching and listening, you too. Merry Christmas. We'll talk soon, hopefully. Sounds good. Merry Christmas to you and your family too. Thank brother. you. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.